For a lot of people, the name Terry Gordy conjures up images of the groundbreaking tag team of the fabulous Freebirds, the heyday of Southern American territory wrestling, and a man larger than life in and out of the ring. For others, it brings to mind tragedy, the decline and untimely death of a great wrestler haunted by addiction. But for some of us, Terry Gordy is remembered as one of the all-time great foreign wrestlers in Japan, a triple crown winner, dominant tag team champion, and living legend from Tennessee to Tokyo. You know about the Freebirds, you know about his brief run in the WWF, and you know about the dark side. Now, it's time to tell the story of the rise and tragic fall of Terry Gordy in Japan. Terry Gordy was a special talent from a young age, starting his wrestling career at 14 years old under the name Terry Mecca and joining Michael Hayes to form the fabulous Freebirds when he was still just a teenager. With Buddy Roberts joining the group, the Freebirds pioneered so much of what we think of as professional wrestling today, including modern entrance music. Their feud with the Von Erichs is legendary stuff, and they made their mark all around the territories in the 1980s. And while all of that was happening stateside, Gordy would get the chance to start a parallel career, six and a half thousand miles from the Dallas Sportatorium in Tokyo for All Japan Pro Wrestling in 1983. Gordy was a six foot four, near 300 pound brawler, and there's nothing that AJPW founder Shohei Giant Baba loved more than a big foreign heel. Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, Steve Williams, Vader, Dan Spivey, Johnny Ace, the list goes on. These were the kind of towering invaders Baba would have his homegrown talent fight valiantly against and ultimately overcome. And it would have been easy to get lost in this crowd of elite big men, but Terry Gordy was special, and even among those names, he managed to stand out. Although he would be used in singles competition throughout his decade-long run with the company, and would go on to hold the Triple Crown Championship twice, the vast majority of Gordy's time in Japan would be in the tag team division. And in just his second match for AJPW, he was paired with perhaps the greatest of all Japan's foreign monsters in Stan Hansen. They stood opposite Genichiro Tenru and Jumbo Saruta, easily two of the company's biggest stars. Quite a tag debut. Gordy must have liked what he saw on that brief August tour in 83, because he'd be back next year to work six times the number of dates, and this time he'd bring his Freebird partner Michael Hayes along for the ride. Together as the Freebirds, they challenged for the NWA International Tag Title twice, but came up short both times. It's obvious that something was working for Bam Bam in Japan. In 1983, he wrestled six shows for AJPW. In 1984, it was 36. The next year, 56. The year after that, he made 64 dates for the promotion. You get the picture. Gordy would also challenge for the NWA International Heavyweight title, losing to company ace Jumbo Saruta in a match where the champion sells like hell for Bam Bam, even blading after a bite to the face. Unfortunately, this very entertaining match ends with a completely unnecessary DQ finish after Michael Hayes runs out from the back to attack Saruta for no real reason. These weak non-finishes were a hallmark of AJPW at the time, and something fans thankfully would not have to deal with by the time Gordy really got going later in the decade. 1985 was a year Bam Bam would get more exposure in Japan than ever, and without his Freebird partner Michael Hayes. His reputation and status as a monster gaijin was slowly and purposefully being built. He would challenge Jumbo Saruta once again for that NWA International Heavyweight title, and again, he'd fall short. And this second match against Saruta isn't exactly the greatest wrestling exhibition of all time. It's got none of the energy and the flow of their first meeting, and it just comes off a little flat. It's clear here that Gordy needed a little more time to cook as a complete singles wrestler. And thankfully, that's exactly what he got. By 1986-87, big things were happening stateside for Gordy, becoming the first ever champion of Bill Watts' UWF. 
He was also still working down in Texas with the Von Erichs and with Jim Crockett Promotions. And despite all of this, he wrestled more matches in All Japan than any other promotion both years. In 1986, he'd take his third shot at the NWA International Heavyweight title against Saruta, and even try his luck with Ricky Choshu's PWF Heavyweight Championship. The third match against Saruta is fine. It's a lot of holds, it's very slow paced, until a pretty exciting final few minutes. Fairly typical for the time. The Ricky Choshu match, though, is a different story. Gordy comes to the ring like a force of nature, hurling chairs 10 feet through the air and causing stampedes of spectators to run screaming around the arena. When the match finally does start, it's at a breakneck pace. It's stiff, it's violent, chairs are used as weapons, and it ends with Gordy coming off as truly menacing, as the monster heel he was meant to be. But neither match would be a victory for Gordy and it seemed that single success wasn't in the cards for Bam Bam in Japan, at least not yet. Later that same year, Gordy got the nod to participate in All Japan's Real World Tag League, an annual tag team tournament that was the gold standard for tag wrestling competition in Japan, and probably the world. His partner was Killer Khan, a wrestler he worked with back in WCCW in Texas. And although they landed in a respectable middle-of-the-table position, this was just the appetizer for what was to come. Because in 1987, he'd be paired with his old buddy and occasional rival Stan Hansen, a monster heel tag team if there ever was one. And they'd have a hell of a tournament, battling the Funks, a young John Tenta, Mitsuharu Misawa while he was still in the Tiger Mask character, Bruiser Brody, of course Jumbo Saruta, and have a four and a half star barn burner against Genichiro Tenru and Asurahara. Gordy and Hansen would end up in a four way tie for second place in that year's real world tag league, losing out to Jumbo Saruta and Yoshiaki Yatsu. But in the summer of 1988, they get their revenge on the tournament winners, taking the newly unified World Tag Team Championship from them and becoming only the second ever team to hold that title. That reign would only last two days before the former champs won their belts back, but this would be a sign of good things to come for Gordy and Hansen. A few months later in November of 1988, the Real World Tag League started up again once more. The titles were vacated and up for grabs to whoever won the tournament. And this year, Gordy and Hansen would clean house. Wearing all black and sporting matching cowboy hats, the giant foreign duo didn't lose a single match. They beat every team they faced, with the exception of Yatsu and Saruta, who they took to a time limit draw, and a wild contest against the ultra heel pairing of Abdullah the Butcher and Tiger Jeet Singh that ended in a double countout. The finals of that tournament would see Gordy and Hansen step into the ring with the current living legend in Genichiro Tenru and a future one in a young Toshiaki Kawada. It's a thrilling match that has Kawada, the youngest and smallest man in the ring, trying desperately to chop the Cowboys down to size with a flurry of kicks and getting absolutely destroyed for his troubles. And Gordy is in top form here. He's selling for Kawada like crazy, moving a mile a minute, and sort of comes off as the more human of the two Gaijin monsters. And in the end, it would be those two monsters who walked away as tournament victors with the tag team titles. This is undoubtedly one of the best matches in the company of this era, and it would be Terry Gordy's only ever five-star match as rated by the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. In 1989, he'd throw the singles gauntlet down once again and challenge Genichiro Tenru, the man he'd beaten a year earlier for the tag belts, for the newly created Triple Crown Championship, now the undisputed top belts in the company. And although the match is a good one, Gordy's singles drought would continue. And of course, once again, he'd make an appearance in the real world tag league, but this time without his tobacco chewing, cowbell swinging partner. This year, he'd be paired with a man called Bill Irwin. Not exactly a name that would go down in history as one of AJPW's all-time greats. In fact, he's probably best known for his time as the hockey-themed WWE heel, The Goon. Gordy and the future Goon would land with a thud in the 1989 Real World Tag League, finishing in the second half of the table with the rookies and old-timers. 
The winners that year, by the way, was a super team pairing of Hansen and Tenru. A duo so overpowered, it seems almost unfair. But if 1989 was a bit of a lull for Terry Gordy in Japan, 1990 would be anything but. All those years of failed singles title challenges, up and down real world tag leagues, and learning from the great Stan Hansen were about to culminate in a blockbuster year for Bam Bam. He'd start the 90s off by joining forces with Dr. Death Steve Williams in a devastating tag team under the unforgettable name of the Miracle Violence Connection. In a company stocked full of big, intimidating foreign monsters, Williams and Gordy were the apex predators. By March, they'd taken down that dream team of Hansen and Tenru to win AJPW's tag team titles, in a match that ended with Hansen melting down and attacking his own partner, not to mention a wild run-in from Jumbo Saruta. Gordy's old partner would come calling again to challenge for the title a month later, this time with Dan Spivey alongside him. It's a match where the idea of personal heat between Gordy and Hansen is played to perfection, with the two tearing each other apart and Gordy using Hansen's own signature cowbell and rope against him. Despite the Texans' best efforts and a pretty damn impressive showing by Spivey, they would crumple under the weight of the Miracle Violence connection. Two months later, Gordy would walk into a ring alone to face his old nemesis and current Triple Crown champion, Jumbo Saruta, the man he'd challenged three times before and three times before come up short. But this time, things would be different. Gordy would get the victory against the aging ace of all Japan with the DDT, and after six years of trying, finally got his singles moment. The match itself is a funny one though. The importance and the drama of the event gets undercut from the start when AJPW make the decision to interview Mitsuharu Misawa while the match is happening. Misawa and Saruta were having a new generation versus old guard feud at the time, and it really feels like this match with Gordy was merely a chapter in their story. He'd trade the Triple Crown back and forth with Hansen over the next few months, and in all honesty, his two reigns with it were hardly noteworthy. But still, this was AJPW's top belt. He won it from one of their greatest ever champions, and he did so with the tag team titles around his waist. That alone might have been enough to call 1990 Gordy's best year in AJPW, but it wasn't over yet. When the real world tag league started back up in November, the Miracle Violence connection dominated the field. Their only loss in that year's tournament was to the vertically gifted but geriatric team of Giant Baba and Andre the Giant. The finals would come down to who else but Gordy and Williams versus Hansen and Spivey. The four monstrous men would do battle in front of 15,000 fans in the Nippon Budokan in a war of lariats, elbow drops, and boots to the face. Gordy does most of the selling here, taking endless beatings from the force of nature that is Stan Hansen and an almost sadistic Dan Spivey. Eventually, he's taken out of the match entirely and rendered borderline unconscious in the front row, while Steve Williams is left to battle both men on his own. In the end, his sacrifices are made worth it, and it's Gordy and Williams standing together in the ring with their arms raised. It's great to be alive, and it's great to be number one in Japan. But while Gordy was riding high in the ring during his time in Japan, outside of it, there were problems. He was a partier, someone who indulged in drugs and alcohol regularly, and increasingly would overindulge. Mick Foley, who worked with him in the deathmatch promotion IWA Japan, tells a story about Gordy on a flight to Japan, popping pills of unknown origin. Quote, we're on an airplane and I see a woman open up a pill bottle, and Terry turns to her and goes, got any extras? She gives him a couple pills. In baggage claim, one of the guys says, what kind of pills were they? And he goes, orange ones. He had no idea what it was. And if it wasn't drugs, it was booze. Terry Gordy was apparently outright banned by one international airline after overindulging in alcohol on a flight to Japan and causing disturbances for other passengers. 
Nikita Kolov talks about going to a Japanese bar with Gordy and witnessing a drunken rampage from Bam Bam. Apparently Gordy had had too much to drink and got out of control. He tore up the bar and started spraying a fire extinguisher before throwing it through a second story window. The police were called and All Japan founder Shohei Baba was tipped off as well. And needless to say, this is not the kind of behavior Baba was fond of. Just take a look at this wrestler code of conduct that was presented to foreigners like Gordy. You can see notes about following a dress code and not drinking until after your match. And here Gordy was, tossing fire extinguishers out of bar windows. As if that wasn't bad enough, the same year Gordy won his triple crown victories and set the wrestling world on fire with the Miracle Violence connection, he reportedly angered Baba by refusing to lose to Hulk Hogan at a big Tokyo Dome show. It was a co-promoted Japan-USA program, and Gordy was dropped from the card, with Hansen against Hogan in the main event instead. But in the ring and on camera, Gordy was on top of the world. In 1991, the Miracle Violence connection would take on all comers, continuing their wars with the old guard Sarutagoon, and of course Gaijin rivals Hansen and Spivey. But their most dangerous foes this year would also be their youngest, Mitsuharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada, the Super Generation Army. The Super Generation Army was a stable that also included Kenta Kobashi and Tsuyoshi Kikuchi at the time, and Gordy and Williams would face down some combination of these four men no less than 19 times that year. There would be no Triple Crown Challenge for Gordy in 1991, and in fact, almost no singles matches in Japan at all. After all, the Miracle Violence connection was on top of the world as far as AJPW went, and that was clearly where Baba wanted Gordy to focus. But one of those few singles outings was a summer barn burner against Misawa in the Budokan. And although there's no title at stake in this match, it's worthy of your time if you want to see Bam Bam at his best as a singles wrestler. His natural talent gets elevated by the genius of Misawa and the two feed off each other in a very fast-paced, very hard-hitting 20 minutes. While in tag matches, Gordy's monster Gaijin aura can sometimes be overshadowed and minimized as he does so much selling for his team, in singles action, it's on full display. Along with the Ricky Choshu match from a few years earlier, this is an example of just how good a singles wrestler Gordy could be given the right partner. But tag team dominance was still the name of the game in 1991, and when the real world tag league came around again, the Miracle Violence Connection were every bit the monsters they were the previous year. For the second year in a row, they only lost a single match during the tournament, this time to Hansen and Spivey, but they wouldn't make it to the finals. Instead, it would be the future heavenly pillars of Misawa and Kawada that would meet Gordy and Williams. And this match against the Super Generation Army isn't just one of the best real-world tag finals of all time. For my money, it's one of the best Terry Gordy matches of all time. All of his best attributes are on display here. Not only is he selling like crazy for an already over Misawa and Kawada, but he still feels dangerous. He still feels like the Terry Gordy who could take a direct hit from a freight train and keep coming with match-ending lariats, DDTs, and pile drivers. This time, it's Gordy who gets the win for his team, delivering a monstrous powerbomb to Kawada to crush the hopes and dreams of the two young stars and about 15,000 screaming fans. While in last year's final, he may have been a little outshone by both his partner and larger-than-life opponents, this year, Terry Gordy feels very much like the violence in the Miracle Violence Connection. In 1992, Gordy would get the nod to participate in the newly revived Champion Carnival. The Champion Carnival is an annual round-robin singles tournament where the winner usually gets a shot at the Triple Crown. Gordy would not make the finals, but had a hell of a showing in his first entry, scoring 15 points in his block and finishing just under Misawa and Saruta. Not a bad couple guys to lose to. As far as tag titles go, Saruta and Tawei would take the belts off the Miracle Violence Connection early in the year, and would keep them until Real World Tag League, with some great matches between the two teams leading up to it. Gordy and Williams were now back-to-back -back Real World Tag League winners, and quite obviously the team to beat in 92. But this was the dawning of a new era, 
As AJPW moved well into the 1990s, a new group of young men would reset the standard for what great wrestling looked like at the company. And many of them were in the ring for this World Tag League Finals. This year, there would be no Miracle Violence connection in the Budokan. No Stan Hansen, no Jumbo Saruta. This year, it was Akira Tawe and Jun Akiyama against Toshiaki Kawada and Mitsuharu Misawa. Three men entering the prime of their careers and, in Akiyama's case, one just beginning his. Back in the States, Gordy and Williams had also been working with WCW in programs against the Steiner brothers, among other teams. WCW had a working relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling at the time, and the two companies co-promoted a number of supercards in Tokyo. Apparently, there was interest from New Japan in the Miracle Violence Connection, and having them appear on their co-promoted shows. And this would become a problem, seeing as All Japan and New Japan were bitter rivals ever since Baba and Inoki split from the old JWA in 1972. Gordy and Williams stayed loyal to Baba over WCW and Inoki, and left the Atlanta-based promotion that same year. 1993 would start off strong for Gordy. He and Williams would win back the Tag Team Championship in January, and Bam Bam would once again be invited to the Champion Carnival. He'd have an even better showing in the tournament this year, placing third overall just behind Misawa and Hansen, and above the likes of Kawada, Tawe, and Kobashi. In May, the newly formed and deadly team of Kawada and Tawe, known as the Holy Demon Army, would take the tag titles off the Miracle Violence Connection. And so, the stage was set for a tag league that would feature monster pairings full of shared history, like Kobashi and Misawa, Kawada and Tawe, Hanson and Spivey on separate teams, and of course, Steve Williams and Terry Gordy. But for Gordy, that tournament would never happen. In August of 1993, while traveling back to Japan for the next tour, Gordy overdosed on painkillers on a flight. After apparently taking 50 pills, he slipped into a coma. Five days later, he'd emerge from that coma, but reportedly with some form of permanent brain damage. And Terry Gordy was never the same after that. People who knew him before the accident say that after coming out of that coma, Gordy was vacant. He was sluggish in and out of the ring, needed extra help getting through his matches, and was generally in a more confused state of being. He was just 32 years old when the overdose happened and had only recently entered his pro wrestling prime. And it seems that Gordy had been overdoing it when it came to drug use for quite some time at this point. Bill Watts, the promoter and booker of Mid-South Wrestling and one-time vice president of WCW, said in a 2001 interview that many people tried to help Gordy over the years to varying degrees of success, including his own wife and tag partner Steve Williams. Quote, he was like a gentle giant, but also a loaded gun in that he might go off and get blasted and then not show up, or show up and not be able to perform to his own standard, end quote. Watts said that wrestling organizations just tried to work around it until, quote, as a promoter, you just got to the point where you could no longer trust the person to show up and be responsible. And that's exactly what happened to Gordy in All Japan. Baba had been dealing with problems from him for years, and this was the final nail in the coffin. In July of 1994, after more than a decade of work and nearly 750 appearances for the promotion, Gordy would wrestle his last match for All Japan. Although his time in AJPW was done, Japan had been good to Terry Gordy. And starting in 1995, Bam Bam found work there in a promotion called IWA Japan, a deathmatch outfit. If you're at all into deathmatch wrestling history, you'll recognize the names he worked with. Tarzan Goto, Mr. Gonosuke, Leatherface, and of course, Cactus Jack. And it's against Cactus Jack that he has a barbed wire baseball bat and thumbtacks match in August of that year. It's a match that Mick Foley recalls he had to coach Gordy through and protect him in. On an episode of his podcast, Foley remembers how odd it was that it was him walking this veteran legend through the match. He would go on to say, I knew that Terry wasn't the same. 
Along with a run in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, this would be the majority of Gordy's work in 95. Whether you like deathmatch wrestling or not, barbed wire board matches with Tarzan Goto are a far cry from winning the Triple Crown off Jumbo Saruta, or headlining the Budokan against Misawa and Kawada. But Terry Gordy persevered. He still had an incredible reputation in the wrestling business and a lot of friends who loved him. In 1996, Gordy would continue his work for IWA Japan, while also appearing in ECW and making his now infamous WWF appearances as the Executioner. In ECW, he challenged Raven for the heavyweight title, teamed with Tommy Dreamer, and worked with the likes of Brian Lee and the other Bam Bam in wrestling, Bam Bam Bigelow. His short WWF stint is probably best left forgotten, but it's become infamous for how badly it went. Gordy portrayed the cartoonish Executioner character, an ally of mankind's also managed by Paul Bearer. Matches with great wrestlers like The Undertaker and Goldust, and even teaming with his old buddy Mick Foley as Mankind, couldn't disguise the fact that the Terry Gordy they all knew and idolized was gone. In 1998, Gordy made a few dates back in Japan for Genichiro Tenru's WAR promotion. Tenru and Gordy were familiar with each other from All Japan in the 1980s, and this is one of the few places Gordy found work in the waning years of his career. Over the next few years, he only wrestled a handful of matches here and there, with his final in-ring appearance fittingly taking place in Japan. It was an IWA Japan 10-man elimination tag match, where Gordy teamed with, among others, Tomohiro Ishii. Tiger Jeet Singh was on the opposing team, and deathmatch wrestlers were sprinkled throughout. Quite an eclectic lineup. That was in February of 2001. On July 16th of that same year, Gordy would die after suffering a heart attack in his home in Tennessee. He was just 40 years old. Shortly after his death, All Japan Pro Wrestling held a tribute ceremony for Terry Gordy. With Leonard Skinner blaring over the speakers, Steve Williams would take to the ring with a memorial image of his partner and friend. Surrounded by fans and wrestlers, a 10-bell salute sounded and the crowd would go silent. It was a clear sign of just how respected and loved the man from Tennessee was half a world away in Tokyo. Triple Crown Champion, a legend in the tag team division, and one of the greatest foreign competitors in the company's prestigious history. That was Terry Gordy.